Let us pray. Father, we're asking that you speak to us through your word tonight. And we pray that what we read and what we hear will be a blessing to everyone. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight we're studying from the book of Psalms again and we're looking at Psalm 27. Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. And that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, seek ye my face. My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I see. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. Because of mine enemies, deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies. For false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart, which I say on the Lord. The psalm has been titled, Faith in Times of Trial. You will see clearly as we have read through together, that the man who wrote the psalm, he offered it as his prayer. Prayer of faith, prayer of trust, prayer of confidence to the mighty God of heaven. He was undergoing real fierce trial. He was going through times of trouble and tribulation. And yet, he said, he will be confident. He has provided for us a challenge, an example. He looks like a hero of faith. And you see this David that wrote the psalm. He had many problems in his life. He was pursued by great and powerful enemies. Sometimes he was even hindered from appearing in the temple. There were times he was cut off from fellowship with his family. In the face of danger, instead of despairing, his faith was always in God. As we look into this psalm, and as we examine the language of David, we know that there are many lessons for believers to learn. It's a great inspiration for the church. It tells us and teaches us that faith in God will always sustain us in the times of trial. Confidence in God will make us fearless and bold in the midst of enemies. I've divided the psalm into four sections. Section 1, confidence in God, verses 1 to 3. Section 2, communion with God, verses 4 to 6. Section 3, the cry of the godly, Verses 7 to 12. Section 4, the courage of the godly. Verses 13 and 14. 
Let's look at the study point by point. Point one, confidence in God. Looking at verses one to three, let's read it and say it again. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came up, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled, they fell. Though an host shall encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, in this will I be confident. From the verses that you have heard, as I read to you, you will see that the man had a lot of problems. In verse 1, he talks of people that threatened him. But then his reaction to all that is this, whom shall I fear? He said, because the Lord strengthened him, of whom shall I be afraid? In repeating that statement twice, whom shall I fear, of whom shall I be afraid? It means that the enemies were really pursuing after him. Powerful enemies. Enemies with political power. Enemies with military power. Enemies with evil power, like Goliath. Enemies with hedonistic or paganistic power. And yet, he said, whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? In verse 2, he talks of these enemies as wicked and as foes. And he said, they were so wild, like wild animals. They came upon him with the intent or the purpose of killing him, destroying him, the way he put it, to eat up my flesh. But then he said, because of his faith and confidence in God, they stumbled, they fell. In verse 3, he pictured the enemies like a host, like a battalion. And he said, they camped around him, against him. He said they brought all their weapons of war to fight up against, to fight against him. And yet, he said, in the midst of it all, even though it appeared that death was very near, he said, I will not be afraid. I will believe in my God. I will be confident. I will trust in God. And it, this is the reason why we're studying this psalm and the other psalms too. That if you think you have troubles, trials, tribulations or temptations in your life, remember that David and other people in the Bible, they had similar problems. And the same God who saw them through, that same God is still on the throne and I believe he will see you through. If we will have the same faith, the same trust, the same confidence they had in God, the faith that saved them, the power that protected them, the same God that saw them through and made sure that they were victorious over all problems and all their enemies, that same faith will make you to overcome. But let us see here what enemies do, the way they threaten, the very first thing that will be a response in the heart of anyone that is being threatened is fear. But then David made up his mind. He said, I will not be afraid. You see, when you become afraid, your mind will be cluttered or clouded or confused. And in the midst of that cloud or confusion, you will not know what to do. You may not even know how to pray. You will not know what direction to go. So, to start with, David gained ground by saying, I will not be afraid. Then my mind can be clear. Then I can see what the Lord has done for me in preparation to receive what the Lord is yet to do for me. And here he made a positive confession based on the reality of his experience with the Lord. Look at verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. You will see that he used the little word, my, 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 three times. Number one, the Lord has been a salvation. He knew that his sins had been forgiven. He had peace with God. In the language of the New Testament, he was justified by faith in God. He believed, therefore he had peace of God. 
You see, you cannot fight two battles at the same time. A battle that is coming against your life from outside. And a battle that is coming against you from inside. If there is confusion within, if there is condemnation within, if there is fear within, if there is lack of peace within, if there is guilt within you because you have not been saved, because your sins have not been forgiven, you will not be able to challenge and face the enemies outside. But he said, one, the Lord is my salvation. He knew the peace of sins forgiven. And the question I have for you is, do you know, do you have an assurance that your sins have been forgiven? That they have been taken away by the blood of Jesus Christ? And that your name is written in the book of life? Do you have the peace of God within you? Do, are you free from all condemnation and guilt? Can you say, there is no, now no condemnation because I know I'm born again and I'm walking in the spirit and not in the flesh? Another thing that he confessed in reality of his experience is, number two, the Lord is the strength of my life. He was strong within. And so, when temptations came, he knew how to resist. He knew how to stand. Because, you know, he said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If he was falling and rising, falling and rising, every time, every day. Today victorious, tomorrow a victim. Today living above the waters of temptation and uh, the following day drowned in the river of sin and temptation. He will not be able to say, the Lord is the strength of my life. This man had been made strong in the inner man. And because of this, he was victorious. Number three, he said, the Lord is my light. That is, his word had become the light in his way. And because of this light, he knew what direction to follow. This is the thing that gave him the confidence, the faith, and the trust. Let's see in other parts of scripture how we are to have confidence and not be afraid. Whatever may be tied. In Psalm 3, from verse 1. Lord... How are they increased that trouble me? Many a day that tries up against me. As David looked at his life, he saw that his enemies increased. The people that troubled him, they increased. Eni enemies without, enemies within. Enemies far away, enemies near. Enemies in his own nation, enemies outside the nation. Enemies on the throne, enemies within his own room within his own yard within his own community enemies among his friends those who are his previous friends enemies among those who never never liked him and he said lord how are they increased that trouble me many are they that rise up against me many there be which say of my soul there is no help for him in god but thou O lord at my at a shield for me, my glory, and the lift up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. He had peace of mind. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. And he says what he had said in another place, I will not be afraid. Of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me, round about he had faith in god he had confidence in god in psalm 1 1 8 psalm 1 1 8 verse 6 the lord is on my side i will not fear what can man do unto me he knew that because he was on the lord's side the lord also was on his side he looked at his heart. He said, I believe in God. I'm on his side. He's on my side. He looked at his heart. He said, I take the totality, the entirety of the word of God. And I do not take away from the word of God. And I do not add to the word of God. I'm on the Lord's side. He's on my side. He calls me to worship him. I look at my heart. My desire is to serve him, to praise him, to worship him. 
I'm on the Lord's side, the Lord must be on my side. He looked at the actions of his hand and he said, all that I'm doing is what the Lord wants me to do. I am obedient to the commandment of the Lord. I'm on the Lord's side, then the Lord must be on my side. You look at your own life. Are you obeying the word of God? Are you keeping to the word of God? Have you, are you on the Lord's side? Have you believed on the Son of the living God? Are you on the Lord's side? Have you taken Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior? Or are you opposed to the Lord? Opposed to Christ? Opposed to His Word? And you disregard His Word? And you are rebellious against His Word? When you are on the Lord's side, then He will be on your side. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man what can man do unto me in luke chapter 12 we read the very words of the lord jesus christ from verse 4 and i say unto you my friends be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do that is where all men come there's not more they can do than that they can only kill the body. It says, be not afraid of them. Whatever they have, whatever they are threatening, are they men or women of dark powers? Be not afraid of them. If the Lord is your salvation, if the Lord is your strength, if the Lord is your light, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear, fear him, which after he has killed, as part to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two fathers? And not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very heirs of your head are all numbered. Fear not therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Here the Lord is telling us not to be afraid in verse 31 and verse 32. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, reading verses 27 to 29. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also, his heavens shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency, and thine enemy shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. The soul that is assured of salvation can walk boldly in the light, in spite of all enemies in his way. And he can talk boldly and confidently because of the promises of the Lord. You see, after our conversion, our God is our joy and is our comfort. He is our guide, our teacher, and our light. Fear departs when faith comes in. The powers of darkness are not to be feared. Why? Because the Lord, our light, is able to dispel and destroy them. When troubles arise, the shield of faith will ward off every blow. Even though it may appear that battle is coming after battle, the confidence of the believer will rest on the everlasting arms. I ask you a question. Are you in the midst of great perils? Faith will make you to overcome. Let's go to point two. Communion with God. From confidence in God, we go to communion with God. It is not possible for a man or for a woman to say, I have confidence in God. 
have my faith in God. I put my trust in God. And yet, he never worships that God. He never communes with that God. He never fellowships with that God. Confidence will lead to communion. Let us look at Psalm 27 from verse 4 to verse 5 to verse 6. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. If you look at these three verses I've read, verses 4, 5, and 6, you will notice the mention of the temple of the Lord, the tabernacle of the Lord, the house of the Lord. Look at verse 4. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Still in verse 4. To behold the beauty of the Lord. Still in verse 4. To inquire in his temple. And in verse 5. It talks about in his pavilion. Still in verse 5. It says in the secret of his tabernacle. And then in verse 6. It said I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy what did he want to do in the house of the lord in the temple of the lord in the tabernacle of the lord let us see again verse 4 to behold the beauty of the lord you see for david what interested him what impressed him is not the privilege or the opportunity of ministering in the house of the lord you see some people they will never, never be interested in attending church service or church worship if they are not called upon to minister. But you see, David, he said, there's something that is in me, a consuming passion, a consuming desire, the single-heartedness. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. I want to be in his temple. The only thing I just like to do there to behold the beauty of the Lord, not to be seen, and not to see anybody, but to see and behold the beauty of the Lord. Are you like that? That there is only one passion, only one desire, only one ambition, only one affection in your heart. You do not want anybody to see you. You do not want anybody to know you. You are not building up an image in the house of God. All that you want is that you do want to behold the beauty of the Lord. Another thing is said to inquire in his temple. He said, I'm not coming as a teacher. I'm not coming as a counselor. I'm not coming as a, as a person that will direct other people, as a guide. All that I want is that I want to inquire in this temple. I have some questions to ask and I want him to tell me. I want to know how I will live. How I will guide my steps. How I will go in my way during the week. Therefore, I want to be in this temple. You see that attitude? That should be the attitude of a real child of God. Number one, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Number two, to inquire, to find out. He came to the temple of the Lord with a teachable, humble spirit. And then you see in, in verse 6, he said, I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices. He said, all I want to do is to bring up what I possess. Is to bring up what I have. And give that in honor as a present, as an offering, as a sacrifice unto the Lord. Do you know some other people, if they come to church, all they want is, they want to get, they want to receive. They want to say, Lord, give me this, give me that. They are not willing to worship or have fellowship or communion with the Lord. But David said, I want to offer. I have come so that I can see his beauty. I don't want to be seen. I have come so I can be taught. I'm not coming just because I have privilege of, of teaching other people. I have come not so as to get, but so as to offer, so as to give. And then he said, I will sing. 
Think about a man who was undergoing all this trouble and trial and temptation and tribulation. And he said, I will sing. And then he said, yes, I will sing praises unto the Lord. He wanted communion with God more than every other thing, any other thing. He said, one thing have I desired. He was a man of one pursuit. A man of one desire. A man of one ambition. A man of one affection. And we should be like that. There should be something within our hearts that says, I want to love God. I want to worship God. I want to fellowship with God. I want to commune with God. I want to offer unto God. I want to sacrifice unto the Lord. I want to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord. I want to inquire in his temple. I want to know the way of life and the way of the Lord, the old path, and I want to follow. Let that be your single ambition. Let that be the only thing you are seeking after as you come to the house of the Lord. Let's look at Psalm 22. And verse 25. Psalm 22, verse 25. My praise shall be of thee. In the great congregation, I will pay my vows before them that fear him. You see that desire? That in the congregation, in the great congregation, like the congregation where you are tonight, like the congregation on Sunday, like the congregation on Thursday, he said, I will praise the Lord. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. And then he said, I will pay my vows. I will give my offering. I will give my sacrifice. I will tell of my testimony. And it is not that I want people to know me or to see me. I just want to offer something to the Lord as I appear in the presence of the Lord. Psalm 84. From verse 10. For a day in thy court is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. This other song, um, writer also, the psalmist, he said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. He said, this is the one thing that I desire. And if you are like that, a man of one desire, a man of one ambition, a man of one goal, that when you come to the house of the Lord, you'll rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Whatever it is you are to do, as a service of ministry to the Lord, you are willing to do it. In Luke chapter 10, verse 39, And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Verse 41, And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, that careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, hearing the word of the Lord, hearing the way of the kingdom, hearing the teaching of the kingdom. But Martha, on the other hand, was troubled, careful, overloaded with activities. They were not simple activities. They were not things that will dishonor the Lord in the normal sense or normal way of saying something did not dishonor the Lord. She was making the house neat. And she was preparing something even for the Lord Jesus Christ. But Mary, on the other hand, she sat attentively with a teachable spirit wanting to hear, wanting to learn. And she felt that Mary was not doing right and said, Lord, will you not tell Mary to come and be busy with me in what I'm doing? And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, your priority is not set right. You are not putting first things first. You are combat, you are troubled, you are careful about many things. But just one thing is needful. One thing ought to be your priority and it is to choose the good part and sit at my feet and listen to the word of God. You know, sometimes in our church here, individuals can get into the danger of being so busy that they do not have time to listen to the word of God. On Monday here, we have three sessions. And you'll be surprised that there may be people that cannot find time to sit down, 
throughout one whole session. From the time of crosses through to the time of praying the last prayer. They are combated about with many activities. And the reason we have all these uh, services is that you will be able to sit down in a particular service and you will not have your mind in any activity, any other thing, but just listen to the word of God. You know, on Sunday we have five services. You, will you be surprised? That there are people that are so encumbered and troubled and careful about activities and they'll be running up and down and they cannot sit down throughout the service from the beginning prayer of Sunday scripture to the closing prayer after the main message they do not have the time they're combat about with many areas of activity but Jesus said one thing is needful make sure that you have a good intake of the Word of God and that you take time to behold the beauty of the Lord. To inquire in his temple. To offer sacrifices of joy unto the Lord. To praise the name of the Lord and to sing unto him. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As the manner of some is. But exhorting one another and so much the more. As ye see the day approaching. We should take time to be men and women of one pursuit, of one desire, of one ambition, of one affection, men and women of one book. If you have divided aims, you'll be distracted, you'll be weak, you'll be disappointed. Our desires of the Lord should be sanctified, should be fervent, should be constant. You see, in the case of David, in the most painful of his circumstances, his consuming desire was not to reign as king. I'm sure you remember that he had been anointed as king. And yet, even though there was so much trouble in his life, and it was appearing that the promise of the Lord, the plan of the Lord for him to reign as king was threatened. He never worried about that. He said, whether it comes to pass or not, whether I reign as the king or not, that doesn't bother me. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. And that is not to reign as king. That is not to be a captain over Israel. That is not to be a leader over the congregation of the people of God. The one thing is that I will dwell in the house of the Lord and behold the beauty of the Lord. You see, in the days in which we live now, terrible days, perilous days, the people that go to church, they do not have this one single passion and desire. That they will serve the Lord. They will behold the beauty of the Lord. They will inquire in his temple. They will sacrifice to the Lord. All they want is that if they can teach. If they can rule. If they can lead. If they can control. But David said, I leave that in the hands of the Lord. That is up to him. If he fulfills his promise for me to reign as king. All I want is that I want the reality of fellowship and communion with God. That's the same thing I bring to you, church, today. That you shouldn't worry what you are or what you become in the church. The only consuming passion of your life should be to be in the house of the Lord. To behold the beauty of the Lord. To inquire in his temple. To be hidden in his pavilion. To be in the secret place of his tabernacle. And to offer sacrifices of joy. And to sing praises unto the Lord. Let's go to the next point. The cry of the godly. From Psalm 27 verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. What did he mean here when he said, when I cry? What he meant is that when I prayed. Because the kind of prayer that he prayed was praying aloud. That's why he said, when I cry. Look at Jim, from verse 1. Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer. Don't you see those two things joined together? Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of faint lips. He said, he will pray to the Lord. And his prayer will not be silent prayer with the mind wandering, with the heart roaming about. 
He said, I will pray. Not with pretense, not with hypocrisy, like Pharisees and Sadducees. But I will pray with concentration. And I will cry aloud. I will speak aloud. And he said, then, O oh Lord, at such a time, hear my prayer, hear my cry. Psalm 27, verse 8. What were the things that he prayed about? And why was he praying? Verse 8. When thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. He said, O oh Lord, when I heard your command, when I heard when you said, Seek my face, my heart responded immediately and said, Thy face, O oh Lord, will I seek. And we have the, the same commandment today that we should seek the face of the Lord. And our hearts should respond like the heart of David saying, O oh Lord, thy face will I seek. When we seek the Lord, why are we seeking the Lord? Let's look at Osea chapter 10. Verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and reign righteousness upon you we're seeking the face of the lord because we need his righteousness remember that david had been saved because he said in verse one the lord is my light and my salvation whom shall i fear the lord is the strength of my life of whom shall i be afraid he was saved his sins were forgiven and yet in verse eight he said you told me to seek your face even after I had been saved, after my sins had been forgiven, and my heart responded, O oh Lord, I will seek your face. You see, after some people are born again, after they have been saved, and their sins have been taken away, they do not know the reason why we are still to be seeking the Lord, seeking the face of the Lord. And here we are told, you seek the Lord until he comes and he reigns righteousness upon you. You know what that means? When you are born again, you have righteousness, but not a flood of righteousness. Not an abundance of righteousness. Not an immeasurable quantity and quality of righteousness. But then you begin to seek the face of the Lord after you have been saved. After your sins have been forgiven. And then he comes and he rains righteousness upon you. You know, if you have ever been in the rain, Whenever you go out without an umbrella and you are under the rain, it gets into your air, gets in every part of your body, affects your clothes, affects your shoes, affects everything you are putting on. You know what the Lord is saying here? The Lord is saying, you have been saved. You have been born again. You have a beat of righteousness. Your life has changed, but come in the rain of righteousness until Every part of you will be affected by the rain of righteousness. Your body, your heart, your soul, your mind, your spirit, your inner man, even your dressing, even your language, everything, what you hear, what you see, what you say, everything will be affected by the rain of righteousness. You'll be drenched, you'll be soaked with the rain of righteousness. That's what we call being sanctified. Some people don't understand. They have a little righteousness. They have a little uh, good life, pure life. After they have been born again. And they say, you know, I've been born again. And I'm righteous. And we tell them, seek the Lord until he comes. And he rains righteousness upon you. Until the righteousness and the holiness and the purity will affect every part of your heart and your spirit and your inner man. But they are too lazy to pray. But the Lord is saying, seek my face, seek my face, so that you can be sanctified after you have been born again. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and this righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you look at this verse, and you look at the way some people pray, if many people pray, you will be asking them, why do you call Jesus Lord and you do not obey the word of the Lord? He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Therefore, when you come in, seek ye first 
the kingdom of God. That is, make sure you are born again. Make sure you are born again. Do not just keep on coming and coming without entering into the kingdom of God. Be born again. That is number one. But you know what people do? They come in here, the first thing they pray for, healing. The first thing they pray for, deliverance. The first thing they pray for, a new job. The first thing they pray for, prosperity. The first thing they pray for, promotion. The first thing they pray for, material things. And Jesus said, those are the very last things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. After you have entered into the kingdom of God, you have been born again. Is that all? Look at that, verse 33. And his righteousness. After you are saved, after you are born again, do you have all of his righteousness? No. That's why you need to make progress. Because after you are saved, you do not have the fullness and the highest quality of righteousness. And it says, you've got into the kingdom of God. Don't stop praying for your spiritual blessing. Seek his righteousness. And we need to obey the word of God after we have been born again. We need to obey the word of God and seek his righteousness so that we'll be righteous, we'll be sanctified, we'll be purified. Let's go back to Psalm 27. From verse 9. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. He said, Lord, you told me to seek you, and I'm seeking you. Don't be far away. Come nearer. You told me to come near, and I'm coming. Let me see you. Let me know you. Let me get the thing I am seeking for, the kingdom and your righteousness. And he said, do not put me away, because I want to fellowship with you. I want to commune with you. I want to be near unto you. And he said, after all, you have been my help in the past. Will you leave me alone now? The journey is not finished yet. I have not finished climbing the mountain. I have not got to the top of the ladder. I have not swung through the sea. Will you leave me in the middle of the sea? O oh Lord, leave me not. Forsake me not. O oh God of my salvation. You have begun a good work in me by saving me, by forgiving me. Are you going to leave me in the middle of the way? He said, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. He said, Lord, already I've been disappointed by close relatives. I've been disappointed by loved ones. I've been disappointed by friends. It may even happen that father and mother may forsake me. My confidence, my joy, my trust, my faith will be that you will take me up. Then he prayed in verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord. I do not want to make a mistake. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I want to know the doctrines, the pure doctrine of the word of God. Teach me thy way, O Lord. How will I, what will I do? How will I behave myself? How will I respond and react to these enemies? All these people that are looking for me to destroy me and eat up my flesh. What should be my attitude? What should be my response? What should be the things I do towards them? O Lord, I can make a mistake. My flesh can be tempted. My mind can be tempted to do evil against them, to slander them, or to fight back, to retaliate. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. O Lord, mine enemies are watching me that I will fall. Mine enemies are watching me that I will commit sin, and then you will leave me alone. Then they will be able to pounce on me and destroy me. Therefore, Lord, every step of the way, teach me thy way. How will I eat? Teach me thy way. Where will I work? Teach me thy way. How will I behave to my wife? Teach me thy way. How will I behave to my children? Teach me thy way. How will I behave to my friends? Teach me thy way. How will I respond to my neighbors and to the strangers? Teach me thy way, O Lord. How will I live my life so that I will see your face on the last day? Teach me thy way, O Lord. And lead me in a plain path. My friends, my enemies, my neighbors, my acquaintances, all the people I see, they are crooked. They practice crooked things. Lord, lead me in a plain path. I don't want to be crooked. I don't want to be wicked. I don't want to be sinful. Because of my enemies, help me to walk uprightly. Deliver me. Not over unto the will of my enemies. My enemies are threatening. They are planning. 
They have strategy. They have a will. Deliver me not over unto the will, the plan, the strategy, the maneuvering of my enemies. For false witnesses are risen up against me. And such as breathe out cruelty. This was his cry. And this should always be the cry of the godly. You see, David was a good soldier. He knew how to handle his weapons. And he always used the weapons of prayer and faith effectually. Today, even in our lives, prayer is still a mighty weapon. In the life of a Christian warrior in the battle of life, the true heart will seek God above and beyond all things on earth or in heaven. He will seek instruction and guidance from God and he will consecrate himself so that he will be sensitive to the touch of the Spirit of God. Let's now go to the courage of the godly. You see, there are people that cry to the Lord and after that, they still become fearful and they run away from the Lord. There are people that cry unto the Lord and after that, they still will not have any courage to be able to face the battles of life. To be able to stand in temptation of life. But then, when you have cried unto the Lord, the next step should be that now you'll be courageous. Why are you courageous? You'll say, well, I spoke to the Lord about that matter. Now, I can have courage. I left that thing in the hand of the Lord. Now, I've, I got, I've got to have courage. I've handed over my enemies unto the Almighty God. Now the battle is not between me and them. The battle is between them and the Almighty. That's the reason I shall have courage. I pray to the Lord. He has never let me down. His promises are ye and amen. And he has promised that he will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And I've made the positive confession. Though my father or my mother and all men forsake me, the Lord will take me up. After crying to the Lord like that, why should I be faint-hearted again? I shall have courage. So then, crying of the godly will lead to the courage of the godly. Let's look at verse 13 and verse 14. I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know why he said, I would have fainted, I would have got discouraged, I would have fallen, I would have run back, I would not have been able to stand, I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Why? Why would he have fainted? Look at verse 1. There was threatening against his life. He would have fainted if he didn't know that God was his salvation. It's light, it's strength. Look at verse 2. There were wicked people, enemies, and foes wanting to destroy him, defeat him, eat up his flesh. If he didn't have faith in God, he would have fainted. Look at verse 3. There was an host encamping against him. There was war rising up against him. If he didn't look unto God, unto the hills from whence cometh his help, he would have fainted. Look at verse 5. He was in the midst of trouble. And if he had not looked up unto the God of heaven, he would have fainted. Look at verse 6. He was in the midst of enemies, as if the enemies formed a sea, a river that could drown him. If he had not looked up to the Lord in the midst of all those troublous times, he would have fainted. In verse 9, hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. It appeared when he prayed, the answer was late in coming. The answer did not come immediately. And he said, God, where is your face? Where are your promises? Why is it you appear to be far away? If he had not put his trust in the Lord, he would have fainted. Look at verse 10. Absalom disappointed him. Even Saul was waging war against him. And it even appeared now that his father and his mother, there was nothing they could do. And they had to be saying, Lord, I know there is nobody on earth for me again. Father, mother, the last people that will not have left me, they are forsaking me. And when they forsake me, I know you will take me up in the midst of it all. He would have fainted if he didn't look up to God. Look at verse 12. He said, deliver me not to the will of mine enemies. His enemies were mighty. 
His enemies were powerful. His enemies were clever. His enemies had strategy and plan. The strategy and plan of destruction, their will, their vow, is that David must die. David must not live. David must not come to the throne. David must not reign. And there were false witnesses. You know, some of the people that ate on his table before, some of the people that he loved before, some of the people that they sat down in fellowship together before, they went out, they lied against him, they slandered him. He said, these false witnesses, they rise against me. He said, every time they breathe, they breathe out hot air of cruelty. That's why he said, I would have painted in your own circumstances, in your own trouble, in all the things that have come against your life, you too, except you look to the Lord, you will faint. You will be discouraged. I pray that the Lord will uphold you in Jesus' name. I had painted unless I had believed to see. You see some people, they want to see before they believe. But David said, if I waited until I saw, I will never get anything. But he said, I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That is why he didn't commit suicide. That is why he didn't kill himself. That is why he never said anything negative. That is why he never backslid. He said, I believe things will change. I believe it will not continue like this. I believe my God is on the throne. I am confident he will help me. I am confident he will not leave me like this. I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Then he said, wait on the Lord. He said, you know what helped me? You know what made me to defeat all my enemies? You know what gave me the victory? You know what gave me confidence? I waited on the Lord. And he said, I pass it on to you. I want to teach you how you too can have the victory and be successful. He said, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Don't let their intimidation or their threatening affect your life. Be of good courage and it shall strengthen thine heart. Then he said, don't forget what I said. Wait, I say on the Lord. And we ought to wait on the Lord. There are many people today, they cannot wait on the Lord. They're too much in a hurry. But we are told, wait on the Lord. In Job chapter 14, verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. All the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change come. You see, Job, he was sick. And it appeared that all, all his flesh was becoming rotten. And he looked at it, appeared that things were becoming worse. And he said, never mind, I will wait. I know God is good. I know God has not changed. All the days of my appointed time, maybe I'm appointed to go undergo this to learn a lesson. I will wait. I don't understand fully everything that is happening. I will wait. And eventually, in the course of my waiting, my change will come. You see, some people, they come to our church here, they are not willing to wait. They are sick. If they don't get it instantaneously, they don't want to wait. It appears that they are passing through some troubles, and if they do not see a change immediately, they are not willing to wait. But Job said, I will wait. I won't be in a hurry. I'll be patient. I know that when the appointed time has come, it will make a change for me. Isaiah chapter 40, and in verse 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Are you weak? Wait on the Lord. If you are weak, the way you can renew your strength and become stronger in the Lord is that you will wait upon the Lord. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Are you slow in your Christian progress? Are you slow in your Christian endeavor? Wait upon the Lord. The way you can become faster in your Christian life is that you wait upon the Lord. They shall run and not be weary. Are you becoming weary or disappointment? Weary, maybe there's chastisement. Weary, maybe there's disappointment. Weary, maybe you have enemies and problems. Weary, maybe you're undergoing trouble. Wait on the Lord. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And it comes as a result. The strength, the power, the encouragement will come as a result of waiting upon the Lord. 
in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and verse 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait, wait, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Wait on the Lord. Have you been coming and you have not been born again? The very first thing for you to do is to seek the kingdom of God. And when thou said, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face will I seek, O God. Seek the Lord. Seek the kingdom of God and be born again. Have you been born again? Then keep on seeking him. Seek his righteousness until the reign of righteousness come upon you. Have you been sanctified? Wait upon the Lord until you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Are you sick? Wait upon the Lord until the change will come. Are you poor? Wait upon the Lord until the change will come. Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you fainting? Does it appear that your strength is not able to carry you in the heat of the day? Wait upon the Lord. Are you tempted? Are you persecuted? Are you going through deep waters right now? Wait upon the Lord. He will renew your strength. Does it appear that the hand of the Lord has been heavy upon your life because of some sins you committed in the past? Wait upon the Lord and it will lift the rod away from your back. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let's rise up and pray. Let's be willing to seek the face of the Lord. Be willing to wait upon the Lord. Be willing to cry unto the Lord. Be willing to seek His righteousness, His purity, His holiness, until you are sanctified, until you are purified. Until all the drag, all the corruption, all the innate, inbred sin, everything has been taken away. Wait upon the Lord. Seek his face. Are you born again? The very first thing for you to seek is the kingdom of God. And be born again. So that the Lord is your salvation. So that the Lord is your strength. So that the Lord will be the light of your pathway. Seek the Lord. Seek his righteousness. Until you are sanctified, purified. All the Adamic nature taken away. And the reign of righteousness. The flood of righteousness comes upon you. And the righteousness affects your heart, your spirit, your soul, your inner man. Your clothing, your hearing, your seeing, your language. Your conduct, your behavior. Until you are fully righteous, totally righteous, completely righteous. Until the reign of righteousness, the reign of righteousness, the flood of righteousness, sanctification and purity will be upon you. And after you are sanctified, wait, wait, wait upon the Lord. For the Father to give you his promise, to baptize you in the Holy Ghost.